Sorry. Okay, cool. It's recording. Uh, what's up, guys? I said I would give this video. Uh, you guys asked on Facebook. I posted about it if you guys would watch this video. So please watch to the end. Uh, this is my fiance. Hi. <laughs> and today we're going to be talking about how we met. But to understand that, we have to kind of go further back. We have to go back to uh months or even years before what actually built up the moment and for sure you're gonna see how it was god that led us together so i guess i'll start off first uh for my part it kind of goes along with my testimony so some of you know some of you don't know for those of you who don't know my testimony started out um basically ever since i was a kid i've always had problems with anger and that's where we say it's a generational curse just like my dad my dad's always been naturally an angry guy and with me it was always passed down to me except my anger turned into rage so i enjoyed fighting my entire life and just brawling and i i loved hurting people it was like kind of a salt to paul moment but when it came to the age of 15 i got baptized uh and i ended up after i got baptized and gave my life to the lord well later on i ended up backsliding and that's one thing when it comes to being with god when you give your life to him then you start backsliding and all hell breaks loose when you allow it. So I ended up getting into this relationship with my, um, with the next girlfriend, uh, raising her child. And some of you, or most of you do know that raising her child at 16 or 15 years old. And it's a toxic relationship just back and forth. But when it comes to that, I raised the kid. I got too attached to the child where the child called me father or she called me dad. And I ended up having to break up away from that. So it wasn't really my ex that I was hurt more with. It was more with the child because I started to recognize her and I got too attached to her where I thought she was my daughter. So that really uh, played a huge part in it. So after I finally got away from it because I felt like if I didn't leave that child, I would have, uh, I probably would have been uh, very, it probably would have been very emotional for her, especially when it comes to her own, her real dad. You know just back and forth it would have left a lot of confusion and pain and suffering so it would be better if i suffered instead of her so that's why i also left and of course the relationship was toxic so it wasn't really god's way of doing it but i still was um, in this backsliding stage so after that i have this falling away and i'm so angry with god and i'm this time i'm actually cursing at him and i'm saying all this stuff and i end up saying um uh, I end up saying, why did you do this? And I end up almost becoming an atheist. So I stopped praying. I stopped going to church. I almost become an atheist. And I fall into this, the new age of meditation, Buddhism, Taoism, Hinduism, uh, all this meditation stuff, chakras, uh, the law of attraction, karma, you know, you name it. I I fell into it real deep. I would even um, meditate so much where I can control my body temperature like monks with my shirt off and like 30 degree weather when it's raining outside and it would it wouldn't affect me i used to practice some stuff with rituals of voodoo and um and a bunch of satanic stuff just masked as being good when it was really destructive then i end up getting ptsd so i have this whole mentality of wanting to hurt people even more and this extra demonic strength i have after meditating and i didn't realize it was a spiritual battle that was going on and I was opening a door for just a bunch of wicked stuff to come in and during all of that when I had PTSD I was tortured every other night for almost I think two years tortured every other night by just these demonic spirits and it literally felt like hell every time and I couldn't do anything about it but I was still too bitter to even call out to God uh, for help or to save me so I ended up being like that for the past two years and one day uh, from this this old friend of mine um she has this youth leader from another church this is before i went with mariah to her church which is now my church and she calls out she reaches out to me this youth leader i end up going to a convention i didn't get saved at the, at the convention i got saved actually in a car with a good brother of mine uh, his name's caleb so i end up going to What's funny is I end up going with him I'm with him in the car late at night before the next day of the convention starts. He tells me a scripture that God gave to him to give to me, Romans chapter 8, verses 8 through 18, reading to me. I felt this heavy conviction, and I, didn't, I told him, honestly, I'm mad. 
I'm mad. And during all of this time, I didn't know until I found out with Mariah. I didn't even know who Mariah was. So she got saved July 2nd, and you'll hear more about that. But throughout the entire month, I'm wondering, of July, I'm wondering, why Why do you want to bless me now? I'm, I'm telling God this time, I'm like, after two years of PTSD, after all this stuff happened to me, all of this stuff, why is it that you're trying to help me now? Why are you answering every prayer? And I didn't know she was praying the entire month for her new husband. Uh, so I'm over here wondering, why are you doing all this to me? Why are you blessing me? Why are you giving me both my jobs? Why am I getting less nightmares? Now you want to do this? You're a little bit too late. Like, And I was mad. So until my... Until that good brother of mine, he told me all this after I told him everything that was happening. I told him, it just feels too good to be real. It's too good to be true. So I end up getting saved in the car. I don't even pray to get delivered from PTSD. I just repent and actually accept Jesus and my salvation is restored. And I, have, I haven't had a nightmare since then. I have no PTSD anymore after two years of it or almost two years. I have no more nightmares, no more demonic attacks. I feel so much peace like someone's hugging you in the inside. And I felt just so much comfort. And after that, my memory just clicked. Some of you freak out with my memory and how I can just remember scriptures right off the top of my head. Well, my memory was horrible until that moment when I got saved, just everything just started expanding. And now I'm able to teach it and I found my anointing. So later on, we I make my testimony in November. So I got saved August 2nd, exactly a month after Mariah got saved. And uh, yesterday... Was it yesterday? Today is the 4th, right? So yesterday was December December 3rd. November 29th, I think it's the 28th or 29th is when I made my testimony. So I'm driving home from one of my classes before I go into one of my jobs. And I'm there. I don't think there's any music really playing. I'm looking out. I'm in my driveway at my house. I'm looking outside and I, I start crying for some reason. And I'm wondering, why am I crying? And there's no emotions being stirred up. It's just me crying out of nowhere. And it's the same tears and feeling I felt when God saved me, when I had that PTSD and all the pain taken away from me. So I start crying and I start praying and I'm asking him, is it time to make my testimony to actually open up and explain everything? So I made that testimony and in the car, just like this by myself. And um, I didn't plan it at all. So God told me it's time to make it. And I didn't know why. And then I see... Days later, or almost a week later, Mariah, she, mess she messages me uh, on December 3rd, and she starts opening up her testimony. And I was actually talking to someone at that time, uh, a friend of mine. So, And later on, that friend decided, okay, I don't, I don't feel the same way. And I felt happy for some reason. It's, it was real funny because I was chasing that friend for years. But then when I – Mariah was my best friend around that time because I started talking more about Mariah and – I talked to her more than even my, my guy friends. So she was my best friend because I think uh, I didn't even really see her in person. I didn't know she kind of catfished me. She kind of catfished me in a good way. I didn't know she was more prettier in person. So I just, we were just relating in, on the phone for hours before because of all uh, scriptures after she finally messaged me th that night. It was like at 12 in the night, midnight she messaged me. And later on, just everything starts happening. And uh, we end up dating later on. So that's when I find out all this stuff. And this is where she, this is where you got to take over. <laughs> okay. Um, so I think it's best that I start off from the, I don't know if y'all remember the 2008 recession that hit the U.S. Mm -hmm. back then. Um, I was living in uh, Michigan at the time. And I was, of course, eight years old. When it happened, I, I mean, I didn't really know all of what was going on, but I do remember my parents saying, hey, so we're going to go ahead and move down to Texas because, you know, your dad had a new job offer and we have your dad's family down there. And I was like, OK, I guess like that's going to be new. But by the time we, we took off, I was about 10 years old at the time. So it was a, one, a culture shock. And then I was trying to start the fifth grade over here too getting used to everything trying to make new friends and stuff like that and ever since I can remember and my parents will be the they'll tell you everything that I was a terrible kid <laughs> growing up I was a real pain in the butt um I was pretty disrespectful towards them but I do remember from the age of five um already having thoughts of not crushes on little boys in school but more towards you know the other girls I had in class and um, I didn't know what it was I was five years old so it wasn't like 
I was like, hey, maybe this is what I am. Maybe this is what I like. I just kind of lived life as every kid did. But in, like, the inside, you, you know, as a kid, when you know you're doing something wrong, it kind of feels like you have to be a little hush-hush, like, with it behind closed doors. And so I never really said anything. And years go by and years go by. My attitude gets worse. My rage gets worse. My um, disrespectfulness towards my parents got way worse growing up, especially in my preteen years. But I never really clicked with anything until I realized that, hey, I was keeping this bottled up for so many years of my life. I took it out on everybody else around me. And my dad says me and my mom are pretty much the same person. And he'll testify. He thinks me and my mom are the same person. So we butt heads. <laughs> we butt heads a lot. And, um, or we used to at least. And from age five to, I want to say about 18, 17, 18 years old. I dealt with homosexuality very, very heavily, and it wasn't until middle school where I had friends that would really heavily support it, and I had support groups around me because I knew I couldn't be like that around my family, and I started to experiment at 13, 14 years old, and I found out that I had enjoyed it quite often more than I did with, with, uh, with males, but I knew that because my parents were starting to come back to church after being outside of church for several, several years, clubbing, partying, you name it, um, they had started coming back to church and there was a part of me that was like, well, why are we coming back? <laughs> like, I don't want to do that. I don't want to come back to church. But soon after they were becoming uh, sworn in as ministers and well, my father, at least, and my mom, uh, a pray singer and then together youth pastors. And as I was growing up in the church from age 10 to 18, I had a very, 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 very hateful nature for everything that had to do with the church. I didn't like the people. I didn't like the music. I didn't like being there. I didn't like any part of it because I knew that what I was dealing with on the inside wasn't going to be accepted by the church. And so my attitude and anger just started getting worse and worse and worse and worse because as I got older, especially coming into the high school years, I experimented far more to where I became... Uh, I started to label myself as this, this, and the other, from being pansexual to um, a lesbian to uh, basically gender fluid, androgynous, you name it, anything in the in the LGBT community. And soon, soon after dating my ex girlfriend, I even came to the conclusion that me, I might have been transgender. And it was crazy because. It took me sitting in my ex-girlfriend's room one night in the summer and she had left the room and it wasn't until it hit me to where I was sitting there by myself saying, if I were to drive home or get dropped off tonight and I didn't make it home and, you know, God, Lord forbid something happened to me, where would I end up? What would happen to me? Because I was the kind of person that was all hurrah about everything, about the LGBT community supported everything, like people are people, love is love, people are going to love who they want to, I could care less. And same thing went with politics and everything that went hand in hand with it. And, you know, you couldn't tell me anything about it because I was going to live my life the way I wanted to and I didn't care. And when it came to being 18 already, I was like, okay, I'm going to move out of my house, I'm going to move in with my girlfriend, I'm going to do this, that, and the other. And if, you know, my parents don't like it, they can't stop me because I'm an adult. And it took that night for me to realize, like, if I didn't make it to my house that day, where would I be? Where would I end up? What would happen to my family and everything like that? And it kind of shook me to my core <laughs> to where that same night I had broke it off with my girlfriend. I um, started to rewind everything in my life. Like, well, how did I end up like this? If I was five years old and already having these thoughts, then, you know, why would God do that? But it took me to, to really sit down and talk to God like I hadn't in years in my life I had cracked open the Bible for real and actually read it for 13 years like um to really think you know he didn't make me this way it was also a generational curse it was a thing that was passed down from my mother and my grandmother that you know hadn't been broken in that way to where it was passed down to me and it's hard to think about because I fought with that idea for so long. Being five years old, like, it's not my decision. That kind of just happens. I was born that way. And um, so after that night, 
uh, that next morning I was piecing everything together like, okay, this event could have caused this event, could have got this event that led me to be where I was. And at age, I was also the fact that at age 14, I was also molested. And so my trust in men really wasn't there at all. <laughs> and, and, and I'm very lighthearted about it because I know it's a very serious topic, but I've already forgive, forgiven the person that, you know, had done it to me. And um, it's, it was very hard to deal with as a kid because I couldn't tell my family. But, you know, that next morning I was like, Mom, I have to talk to you. And I kept in mind, I really, I would hide everything. I was such a liar as a kid. You could, like, I would hide everything. And I came clean about everything from my girlfriend to my molestation to a bunch of other things I'm not going to get into right now because it would take forever. But I remember her telling me, like, I, of course, was proud of you at your high school graduation, but I've never been more proud of you than I have now, than I am now. And we spent the next hour and a half, give or take some time, um, talking scripture and and uh, biblical stuff and praying together and just like forgiving one another. And that was probably the biggest weight taken off of my shoulders I had ever felt. And that next, um, that youth camp that same month was coming up and I couldn't have been more excited because every youth camp before that I hated going to, <laughs> like I didn't want to be there. Uh, because I had to put on a, a fake, you know, facade of this person that I wasn't, I wasn't at all. And so it felt good to go to that youth camp and be like, hey, like the chains are finally free. Like I don't have to deal with this anymore. And this isn't me. And so I remember saying, you know, God, I know that for all my life, I never thought being with a man was ever going to be possible. Like at all. <laughs> whatsoever. And, um, but after the last service of that youth camp it was actually called um this is my identity was the theme of that camp which is very very you know biblically like prophetically planned out and there was it's right the the place that we have it at the sanctuary that we have it at is right in front of a lake where there's a dock and so usually we would finish services around nine o'clock sometimes and then we had some free time after before we had to head to bed and so i walked out after the service just like feeling completely broken but in the best way possible like he had to break me in order to piece me back together so i walked over to the pier and i kind of just looked over the water and i was like god i know that you have a man out there for me that's gonna be you know the man that you're already preparing the heart for so that you know he accepts me for what my past was and what my future is going to be in you and that he's gonna love you before he loves me and I remember sitting there on the dock pretty much the whole time before we had to go inside, just crying out and just so grateful and, you know, just like in awe. And I really have no words. Like it's something you have to experience for yourself. But um, not too long after, I know that I told, I was like, God, I don't need it now. <laughs> like it's going to be in your timing because I don't want to have to search for it. I don't want it to be something that I'm enforcing. And, um, Everything that happened after high school, I had a lot of people that I really didn't talk to. And so I was going through my social media um, following and followers, just removing some people that I know I wasn't going to keep in contact with. And it was that dis that late November, <laughs> late early December. And I was like, okay, who is this guy? Like, I don't remember following him. I have no idea who this guy is. Like, let me see if maybe I recognize him from somewhere. And so I clicked on the profile. And I was like, yeah, I don't recognize this, this, but I saw a YouTube link in his um, bio. And I was like, this is new, like, you don't really see this happening with many young people. And so um, I clicked on it, and it happened to be his testimony. And I was like, this is really new because you really don't see kids, uh, of course, our age, posting things like this on, on social media for people to see. And so I watched the whole thing, and I was low-key crying. I don't know if I told you that. I did tear up a little bit. Um, you never told me that. Yeah, I did. I did cry a little bit. It wasn't like bawling, but I did, you know, shed a tear or two. <laughs> and I sent him uh, a text message basically saying like, hey, I know you probably don't know me and I really don't know you either, but I saw your testimony and it was very touching and I, you know, I hope everything's going well and God bless you. And I remember us talking for a while after that and then he would send me pages of his uh, study notes and his biblical verses that he was going over. And telling me, like, he's like, I don't share this with anybody, so you're kind of a first. And so I was like, oh, this, well, okay. 
like and of course i wasn't looking for anything he wasn't looking for anything we weren't and that's and like i said i was talking with so, someone so I, we were just best friends and it was funny it. it's i tease about the, i tease him about this all the time i was like yeah you were talking to somebody remember that time you told me you know do you know any good places to like take someone on a date i asked her how to take <laughs> someone else on a date i was like no i don't i don't really go on many dates so i wouldn't know mm -hmm. and um it turned into a while after that, he told me that they weren't t talking or together anymore after that. And um, we started to talk on the phone for four to six hours a night. And I know it would annoy the crap out of my little sister sometimes. She loves me. But they're like best friends now. And um, we would just talk all things biblical and all things like our, our spiritual walk with God and our testimonies and our families and what we were going through and what we've discovered and how we got to the point that we were at. And I don't know if you want to tell them about the night we finally met in person. Yeah, so I'm actually out here. Uh, I pick her up because I have this this party. This uh, I think it was like a Christmas party, a Christmas dinner for one of my jobs with all the staff members from the adult daycare. And we still argue about this to this day. We about she thinks I think she. I, I didn't invite myself. I thought she invited herself. She says I didn't. Whatever. But <laughs> I, I pick her up here. And she's in her dress, in her black dress with her makeup on. That's when she had her short hair and her bangs in the front. I look nothing like I do right now because I look all tired. She catfished me, actually. She didn't. I didn't think she was going to be a little bit taller. I didn't think she was going to be uh, prettier in person. So we actually got to know each other um, spiritually before we actually knew each other in person. And it, it's kind of a funny way God puts it. But to actually focus on the spirit than to, than to focus on the flesh. The flesh came after mm -hmm. So it was uh it was pretty funny and I kind of I was stunned for a bit. So she says I had this whole spark in my eye and I didn't notice. I was just like trying to play it cool because I have my whole leather jacket. Mm -hmm. I'm in here. I opened the door for her. Then I actually get her a rose that day when those guys always come in, those Mex the Mexican guys always come in asking if we want a rose, so I bought her one. I just felt like I had to. And she was testing me at the dinner. And I know I know she was because I when to. I prayed, I prayed before I ate. I never really do that, but when I got saved, I got in the habit of praying before I eat, and she, I felt someone look. I felt her looking at me, and she's like, and she starts telling me after I finish, and I'm like, all right, amen, praying to myself. She says, you know, my dad says uh, it's always good for someone to pray before uh, they eat, and all this. It's always my dad says this, my dad says this. So I was like, well, that's cool, I, I guess. I didn't know I was being tested, but all right. I have to. You got to be careful sometimes. Yeah, I'm like your dad, so whatever. Yeah, they're twins. Yeah, I know. Except I'm not bald. He's he's probably gonna see this. Mm -hmm. We'll edit that out. Um, yeah, but and you know after that we started dating. I asked. She invited me to her church. To um, meet pastor for the first to meet time. Her, to meet our pastor for the first time when he was her pastor, and later on, uh, well, I mean, it's probably gonna go more into detail, but I ended up meeting him. He. He liked me. I hope he did at that time. And now I'm into crazy socks. We have to have crazy <laughs> socks every time we go to church. But to get to the point, so later on I actually have to, I felt like I had to leave the church I was going to and I had to go to their church. Some conflict, a major conflict actually. That's another story. But during camp, during camp we, uh, when I actually knew she was my wife, so I felt it. I can still feel this it. This was the camp after the camp. Yeah, that I went so at. this is... A year later so in july think about it, like july she's going through all of this in july she has she's praying for her husband because she came out of homosexuality i just came out of the new age and ptsd and a bunch of demonic stuff and she is praying for her husband this entire time in july and in july i wasn't even really uh born again yet again or restored in my faith and she's praying for her husband while I'm over here getting blessed and everything's going my way for some reason. I'm getting mad at God. Why are you doing this to me? And I didn't know she was praying this for her husband way before we met. And that all took place. And exactly a month later, I was uh, saved. Home. But uh, so a year later, which this past July that just happened of 2019, we go to the camp. She tells me, no, baby, you need to go to this camp where I got saved. So we go to that camp. We go to that camp and... Uh, I experienced it for the first time, so I was excited about it because she was going on and on about it. And to go to know that it was a place where my to know it was a place where she got saved, to know it was a place where God told her to pray for me 
and to restore all of that. So we're really kind of started too. And the third day of camp was one of the best and craziest days. It was a lot of stuff I didn't know was being exposed, but also I'm praying in tongues and I didn't pray in tongues in forever. She hasn't prayed in tongues in forever from that time. So I'm praying in tongues. I don't even know where she's at. I thought she was on the other side of the room, which she was. And as I'm praying in tongues, uh, what is it her? She, she comes to me. I had my eyes closed. So I have my eyes closed. I'm on my knees, on my face, on the ground, just sobbing and crying and praying in tongues from God's Holy Spirit. And then after that, I just say, my wife. I say it out loud. I confess it out loud. And I'm just my wife. And I open my eyes for some reason. And I see she's right here next to me on the left side. And as soon as I saw her praying with me with her eyes closed, uh, God starts to tell me, I can, I've never heard it so clearly where he's told me, that's your wife. Like, this is your wife who I've given you. And I was freaking out. I was like, whoa, like, I, it's been a long time since I've experienced something this supernatural from you. And, um, and it's crazy because from the times I would text her a huge paragraphs of my studies when we were best friends, um, she always had her dad to ask questions. I never had really anyone to ask questions unless it was my grandpa, but he no, lives in Mercedes. Don't. So I never really had anyone to ask. So when she asked me, oh, who, who do you ask questions? And I told her, well, God had to teach me himself. Nobody couldn't really teach me. I didn't have anyone to teach me about other religions or experience it. So I actually experienced it and God had to show me through his Holy Spirit in the Bible. And she freaked out because she thought somebody taught me. Nobody taught me at all. So that's um, how you know it was an anointing for both of us. But uh, I didn't know she and I told her about that. And then she told me from her side at camp what happened. Do so you want to say that? Oh, yeah. So that uh, third night, uh, I, I was on the other side of the room. <laughs> I was praying with some of the younger girls that attend the church as well. And um, I had seen him kneeling over there by himself. Like my brother had already gotten up. My dad had already gotten up. They were praying by themselves near the, the, the seats. And he was still there. And there was a tugging in my heart saying, you know, you need to go pray with him. Like, if you guys are really meant to be together in this relationship, you need to go over there and, you know, kneel and pray with him. And um, so I went like that. I was walking towards him already, and I kneeled down, and I started to pray. And God was already kind of telling me, like, you know, you know that prayer that you were praying about a year ago in the same place? I was like, yes, like I, I, I remember, I remember very clearly. Um, he was like, well, this is the man that, you know, I've blessed you with. And I remember us holding hands and there's a picture of it. I'm sure you guys have seen it already. I think I put it on my profile um, once. That I think sister, or the first lady of our church had taken, or one of the youth girls. And um, it was, I was already uh, praying in tongues that night as well with him. And it was the, you know, the presence of God was just so strong in that place to where even after we had finished kneeling and praying there for a while. You couldn't shake it off. We were still sitting in the seats, like, um, praying and crying and crying out and speaking in tongues. And it was, it went on for what, a good two hours, I think. Yeah, and it felt like, that's how eternity is. When you spend time with God, you don't even keep track of time. You're just in the moment. It feels like seconds. Mm -hmm. And you didn't know that two hours have gone by. It can be like just minutes and two hours have already gone by. And when you're just soaking in that presence and there's this heavy fire, you feel like a warmth all around you. You can't shake it off. It's not something you can even make up. And it's, you have to experience it. It's words can't even describe how it really feels. Uh, and even after that, uh, that night, and after that night, that same night, we had gotten dismissed from the service already and we were getting ready to go play like volleyball or something that night or something I beat your like dad, that. by the way. And, um... I was like, hey, babe, like, I really need to show you the pier where I prayed for you. Like, the same, it was the same night, third night of a service, um, at night, of course. And so I took him, and you could just feel, like, a peace right there in that same spot that I had been praying for, for him at. And, um, we were, we just started to talk to each other about some of the deepest stuff that I don't think we had even brought up, um, in too much detail. And about how we were praying for it and you know what led us up to this point and like how really unworthy we were to be sitting in the spot right now mm -hmm. but how everything you know that God had put in front of our in our lives had already lined up for us to be in this moment and we were just talking on and on I don't even think we went to the volleyball game I think we went to the last I like, went, couple I, minutes yeah I went at the last minute I still beat your dad and everyone by the way I won and, by the way uh, 
we were just talking there for the longest time. It was like after that, after sitting there, you could kind of just feel like, you know, like this is, this is going to be, you know, forever. Like this, you know, God has ordained this for sure. Oh yeah. So, and then what was actually funny about that camp, I know some of you have probably said, oh, you need to preach, you need to preach in this church and this and this. And a lot of you love the way me and Mariah are. We've struggled for sure. We're, <laughs> we're still young. We have like, we ain't worthy. We're not. But what was funny is that her dad prophesied over me. Her dad actually gave prophecy over me. And they were consecrating. To consecrate means to have a higher calling, a higher purpose. So they prophesied over every one of us, the youth, 